It is now evening, my drift. Light set was shortly ago and you should now all be in your homes. We had no announcement last light set due to the remixing of the previous recordings, as I'm sure you all noticed, because it did not quite go as planned and it was a lot of repetition. But the feasting death did remain at bay and all was quiet throughout the evening, so the Enchanters and I are considering this a step in the right direction. You may also have noticed that the test involving 10 of you has yet to happen. We had to adjust some of the routes due to overlap and unforeseen circumstances, other things initially missed in the original plans. So that test will be happening tomorrow evening, finally. Those of you who are going to be involved should have already received your notices about this, so the only people this should come as a surprise to are those of you who are not involved. Now I, as town judge, would like to express how grateful I continue to be to have such a well-functioning system given to us by our wonderful Empress and further extend that gratitude to the remaining enchanters who have now permanently relocated to Madrift to keep all of this system properly functional. And of course, I also extend my gratefulness to the Queen's Guard who are here to keep us safe. There are a few short dove postings I want to announce. They are, of course, also listed on the dove board for those of you who actually pay attention to it. But I wanted to bring a few of them to your attention this evening as well. The first is that no one is permitted to apply to join the Queen's Guard. Madrift as a whole is conscripted in a duty to be the target of the Feasting Death and may not abandon this duty to fulfill another as volunteers for the Queen's Guard. Everyone within Madrift, myself included, has been unable to apply for the honour of being a Queen's Guard since the system of arcane lights and sending stones were put in place. It is entirely my fault for not stating this sooner. I understand your frustrations at the misleading recent openings posted on the Dove board. I do apologize. That posting is meant specifically for the Queen's Guard stationed here, who are wishing to serve elsewhere. And as a public notice to the rest of you that we will be getting new Queen's Guard which actually is the other notice that I want to bring to your attention this light set, Madrift. The Queen's Guard in town will be rotated next week. Some will be staying, of course, but a few will be leaving, and I expect all of you to treat the new Queen's Guard with the utmost respect once they arrive. However, this is also an opportunity for anyone who wishes to send or request something from Queenstown to do so free of charge in terms of sending the requests. For instance, let's say the person who has been requesting wool and has still not received a reply, this is your chance to ask directly if you know of any vendors or shops that you want to write to specifically, you can send this for free. And for those of you with family in Queenstown, this is your opportunity to send them something you normally can't due to the prices or the unreliable doves. I simply ask that anything you wish to be sent to Queenstown, you send up to my home, the judge's home, up to the day that the new Queen's Guard arrive, because once they are here, we will no longer be taking anything to put into the carts, the enchanters will no longer be willing to make accommodations and move things around, we will have to reject anything else, even if it is a simple letter, and you will be forced to pay the regular means through the Dove Couriers to send your mail. And I'd like to remind everyone that after your home or business or whatever you call your building is inspected, you become eligible for signing the petition for the remodeling of Madrid's buildings. Our structures are in need of sturdier foundations and we might even be able to construct a wall if the enchanters and I can devise a way to do so without it being destroyed either by the weather or the feasting death. But the home inspections are nearly complete and as far as I have been made aware, 
there hasn't been anything worth reporting, and I am quite proud of all of us here in Madrid for being such upstanding citizens of Zidia. I know a few of you have lost books from foreign lands and your own personal writings might have been confiscated due to your choice of wording, but overall, no one has been convicted of anything and we should consider that a point of pride. I have been told by several Queen's Guard that it is rather rare for inspections to go so peacefully, especially in places such as Madrift here, where they are not common or have never happened before at all. So this is very good news. Please don't forget to come and sign the petition. Now for what I have planned for this evening, it is nothing as special as we had last night when I read Sumi's story from Hostwin. Instead, I have found a story about the feasting death within the tome that was gifted to us by Citadel Acclamations to Zivian Night Terrors. It is under the section called Active Terrors, but since we're all well aware of it already, there's no new information really within it that should cause any children to become overly frightened or any adults to complain about the object. I, I'm going to reiterate that. I expect no complaints about the story that I'm going to read come Light Rise, because it is about the feasting death and it is nothing new. However, that does remind me that a complaint jar is likely to be put out in a few nights. Gonjin is doing wonderful work going through the suggestion jar and has agreed that once all of the notes inside have been read over and addressed in one fashion or another, they are more than willing to start going through a complaint jar as well. So please be patient, Mardrift. We are close. We are just not quite there yet. Now, as for the story that I plan to read, aptly titled The Feasting Death, it is a short one, and I've actually heard it before in a more factual format. It covers the loss of Dread Wastes, the town further north from us that, well, it was a town further north from us. But this is a more story format rather than a factual, more historically addressed writing. So it should be more entertaining, though it should also be considered a bit of a cautionary tale, and hopefully it will convince you all to make better decisions than the ones made in the story if you ever face a similar circumstance in the future. So here we go. <coughs> the Feasting Death In the solitude drifts of Zivia, choked in fragrant vapours of decay and lost in mind-altering smog, a shimmer across the barren, cracked ground moves in a crawl away from any warm light. Towards the shadows it scurries in jerking, blurry-eyed motions. Is it fast? Is it slow? The difference lies in the refractions of light in which it appears beneath. The brighter the purple Dezivian sky the slower the mirage-like magic appears. But in the more common dark, especially after light set, when the sky turns fully black, the abomination appears in the lash of crevice wind and consumes everything in its path. Marla, born and raised on the border of the Solitude Drifts and the Notchlands, Without a fleeting desire to go elsewhere or outside of Dezivia, finds herself alone in the evening wilds. Her horse is strong, her own health is at its peak, and the way she travels is well known. The ranch she calls home sits two hours south of Dread Wastes that town that cannot be said to fully reside within solitude drifts, nor fully within the Notchlands, suffering the maddening vapours as often as it does the sinkholes that fill themselves back up at light rise. Mala makes her trip between home and town nearly every day, leaving at light rise and returning long before light set except for today, except for this evening. Mala has made a mistake. It is not before light set. It is, in fact, one hour after. With no lingering light 
filtering through the thick clouds across the Dezivian sky. No beautiful shimmers of purple to guide her way home in any mild comfort. But that is all right, for Marla has a lantern, and her trusty horse has never fallen prey to the beasts that call the space between her ranch and Dread Wastes their home. Her eyes are like the eyes of most Dezivian children, fully capable of seeing the difference between shades of black and which shadows are cast by another or are moving in and of themselves. Which is exactly how she sees the creature she fears most before it has chance to take notice of her. But even a Dezivian war horse can't stop immediately and the smallest foal is unable of walking silently on brittle dirt. Marla knows to kill her momentum is to kill herself, as well as that to continue on is to ride straight into the mouth of her demise. She is afraid. The land itself fears for her. The dark sky tries to cast a bit of purple light to shield her from the unseen gaze of the abomination lazily waiting ahead. But the dark night gives no quarter. Marla knows that she has been seen when the wind picks up, an unnatural breeze created by the putrid breath of the monstrosity with no mouth. Marla is terrified. And she can only think to do one thing. Run. Her horse does not turn fast, but the wide arch gives her just enough space that she feels the feasting death lunge and miss by mere fractions of space that startle her mount into riding even faster. It was luck, or it was simply the creature playing with its food. Mala will never know. She races away from home, but there is only one other direction she knows how to travel. Towards Dread Wastes. If she goes anywhere else, she might fall prey to sudden crevasses or poison fogs, which won't kill her any faster and will simply leave her all the more helpless for the thing watching her turn, waiting for the next prime opportunity to jump at her. The feasting death does not pounce again, nor does it give chase. It stalks Marla in a hazy distance of shadows and drifting darkness. She can feel it behind her, always within reach, just shy of touching her. It has become one with the night air, and she's no longer certain it is behind her at all, rather than taking shape in the shades before her or off to the side. She cries. Tears of silent rage and fear and desperate hope. She cannot lead it home. She will not lead it home. But she cannot lead it to anyone. Yet Marla does not know where else to go. Everyone who knows they are going to die wants to live, and everyone knows their best chances for survival in the wilds of Dezivia are to sacrifice someone else. Marla brings herself, her mount, and the feasting death into the desert maze-like streets of dread wastes. The town is silent to avoid the nightly mists of fog that come from speaking breaths which carry madness. And still, to keep from stepping into the sudden crevasses that swallow people just as easily as they do homes. There is no one to scream at Marla for putting them all in danger. And there is no time for Marla to shout her sorrows at having used the town as bait to save herself. Marla is incapable 
of saving herself. The presentation of helpless prey is more enticing than the thrill of an inevitable hunt. The feasting death finally catches its prey that it's toyed with for long enough, only encouraging its insatiable appetite during the run. Mala is gone, a single flick of shadow, one second of drifting vapor across the back of a horse that stumbles dead on its kicking knees when its back is suddenly bitten from the rest of its body. The dying thralls waken the nearest citizens, whose horror-filled shrieks wake the nearest ones next to them, whose terrified screams waken those even further until the entire town of dread wastes is awake, enchanting their presence to the enthralled and ravenous abomination giving the feasting death a banquet and the privacy to take its time to savor it. Now, this is a fairly accurate telling of what I was informed of, Mardrift. In case any of you are unaware, I'm free to explain this more come light rise if you find me and we both have the time. Mardrift received a dove from Marla's father, who delivered the news of what happened in Dread Wastes. As town judge, I sent a series of doves to confirm it to the other town judges nearby who might be able to well, either confirm or deny it. Will return to me from Bone Meadow, the crevasse-edged town northwest from us, and what has since been reconfirmed by the Queen's Guard here in town with us, it all suggests that the initial notice from Marla's father was entirely accurate and true. This story only reiterates it and puts it down more solidly in Dezivia's history and makes a story out of it rather than a simple report. So we should all think hard about this story and the choices Marla made. She did the right thing by abandoning the idea of going home, but she made an arrogant mistake thinking she could sacrifice the town of Dread Wastes to save her own life. As we all know, no one can outrun the feasting death, and trying to use others to save yourself when it's already got you in its sights is, it is, well, it's selfish and a waste of your last moments. There is no escaping the feasting death. Marla should have ridden off into the wilds and spared her family and the town of Dread Wastes, rather than being too afraid to die that she wasn't even willing to you know, her poor choices were a large factor in our Empress's benevolent choice to provide us with these arcane lights and sending stones, so I, I will say no more on the matter. However, that story was rather short, and the last three nightly narrations, including the night where the old recordings were mixed together, the last three nightly narrations have been ending far too quickly. While this is not necessarily a problem, I have heard plenty of complaints that say it's an annoyance. And with everything else going on, I truly am striving to make your lives easier here in Madrift, not more annoying. There wasn't another story I found to read from Desivia Night Terrors, but with Ganjin's good work, I do have a few suggestion jar notes that I am safe to share for the entire town to hear. This ought to help pass the time. Alright. First, I have one about the home inspections. The Queen's Guard and Extinction Keeper Laos are frightening. Ooh. When the home intrusions happen, someone more familiar should be present to put the families at ease. My wife and her sister were terrified. I can understand the fear they felt as it can present as intrusive to suddenly have your home inspected by strangers, but these strangers are officials operating under the rule of our benevolent empress and no one, no one should be afraid of them. As for your actual suggestion to have someone familiar accompany them, I'm not sure who you'd propose for that or how how it could be done, really. It doesn't seem feasible. I don't mean to put myself in too important a position here, but other than myself, the town judge, the only other people who everyone should know to some degree or another are the owners of Clay Draft and the Saw Dessert. 
who can't really go walking around through everyone's homes at the same time that the Queen's Guard and Extinction Keeper allows can. Which does remind me, I've been told a few times in the street quite recently that I pronounce the sword desert wrong. It's not desert, it's desert, and I am aware of that, but habits are difficult to break. I will work on it, Mardrift. Though it hardly seems like something vital. Next, we have Can Gonjin be the evening narrator? A woman's voice would be nicer to listen to in the evenings. I am. hmm. I'm not sure how Gonjin feels about this idea. I cannot speak for her, and seeing as she passed the suggestion on as appropriate to read aloud for the entire town to hear, I think it's going to be perfectly fine for me to bring it up with them tomorrow. Though their duties reading the suggestion jar and soon to be reading the complaint jar will keep them busy, I'm not sure what to expect. You will have to wait for their answer. It's not up to me, it's up to Gonjin. On continuing on, maybe Extinction Keeper Lowers could not be in the recording box for a night. They make more noise than I think Judge Tolfia or they realize. There's always some kind of shuffling or ticking in the background. You would be correct. I did not realize that Extinction Keeper Laos made enough noise for it to always be heard on the evening narration. Last recording we did, the, the actual recording, not just the nightly narration playing across the town, Extinction Keeper Laos was louder than usual, choosing to continue their work from the day in the recording box with me while I narrated. Thankfully, they are not doing that again this evening. They put all of that away at light set. And usually, I do not hear them doing much off to my side or behind me. But as for having them not be in here with me, or whoever the evening narrator is in the future, that is entirely up to Extinction Keeper Laos. I've read your suggestion, they have clearly heard it, but the results remain up to them. Their duty is probably more easily done in here with the evening narrator, but as I said, it's entirely up to Extinction Keeper Lau's discretion. This suggestion is from Chelly. Address what I put on the dove board or I'll deal with it myself. Alright, alright, yes, I can do that for you. Perhaps I should have done it earlier, but there was no narration last light set and, well, Putting up my own dove post beside yours wouldn't have made much of a difference. Regardless, Chelly is still missing her jewelry, and she's put up a post quite plainly on the dove board that states she knows who took it. There is still the option of you handing it in to me so that I may return it to her without question. You can even leave it with Gonjin now. And Gonjin will give it to me and I will make sure Chelly receives it. Or you could admit your crime, since Shelly knows who you are, and face them directly and return it yourself. Either way, whatever you do, I hope you do what is right, and you give it all back to its rightful owner. Shelly, you are in your full right to word things as you have worded them on the dove posts, but please do not retaliate against whoever stole your items. Allow myself, the town judge, and the queen's guard to deal with it if the matter persists as it is. I would much rather you come to me or the Queen's Guard than go after this person by yourself. We don't want things to get out of hand. And I think that should be enough for tonight, Mardrift. I've told a story which has a historical aspect we should all learn, read some suggestions, and the length of the narration should now be acceptable. I truly do hope that none of you have complaints about the length of this one and the repetition of it being repeated throughout the town. Have a wonderful evening, Mardrift. We will now stop the recording and replay it. <laughs>